Hello, and welcome to my channel. My name is Jonathan Cohn, and today I will be doing a special video about my experience at GalaxyCon in Richmond. Uh, you will notice I am wearing a t-shirt in this video because uh, this is not my part of my normal recording schedule. Um, uh, this is what I wore to the convention, and so I thought I would try to create some um, uh, synergy between the, the visuals that you'll see in audio uh, between the two, and also just because I'm so excited I want to talk about this. So, for those of you who do not know, GalaxyCon is a convention that happens uh, here in Virginia, and also it happens in North Carolina every year. Uh, back in 2020, I went to the one that was held in Richmond, and then in 2021, I went to the one that was held in Raleigh, and I got to meet several authors there, and it was lots of fun, and I loved the experience, and I got to go to Bard's Tower both times, and I'll talk about them in just a second. But this year, I went to the one in Richmond on March 20th on Sunday, and it was an an absolute blast. I got to meet two of my favorite authors. I got to meet Michael A. Stackpole and Dan Wells. Um, both of them are wonderful gentlemen. They're very kind, very nice to meet. Um, I had lots of fun getting to talk about uh, th their books and also just things in general with them. And uh, I actually do have an interview with each of them, which I will be playing in a moment. Um, so that's that was a lot of fun. And then I also have an interview with the CEO of Bard's Tower. And Bard's Tower, uh, I'll go into this a little bit more later in the video, but they are a company that basically is a bookstore store for conventions, and they go to a convention, set everything up, handle all the business for the authors, so that all the authors have to do is be there and, and get to meet everyone. It's a wonderful service that Bard's Tower provides. And so uh, I got an interview with their CEO, so you have three interviews in this video. And uh, first, I want to talk about Michael Stackpole. I brought uh, some books of, from home that I got to sit, get signed by him. And then I also uh, got to purchase some new books by him, which was really exciting. I got to get my Star Wars books of his signed, which include I, Jedi, and also the five X-Wing novels that he wrote. I do not have my uh, copies of um, the his two New Jedi Order novels that he wrote. Those are his only other two Star Wars novels. Wait, that's not... Yeah. And um, so I unfortunately can't... can't sh they couldn't have those signed. Uh, someone else has those at the moment. But I still got these ones signed, which was a lot of fun. And then I also got some fantasy books of his signed, including my favorite fantasy book of his... my favorite book of his in general, which is uh, Italian Revenant. Uh... And I'm so excited to get you to hear about him talk about this. And then also he wrote uh, his books, An Enemy Born and An Enemy Reborn, books I have not read, I have purchased, and I look forward to reading. Uh, by the way, all my books that I had previously, they're all beat up, I'm sorry. Um, uh, most of these were secondhand books that I purchased, but... So he was willing to sign all of these books. Uh, he was very kind and uh, was a lot of fun to talk to. But I also purchased some books from him, including his newest release called Gears of War Ephira Rising. I'm sorry about pronunciation if I butchered that, uh, but it is a Gears of War standalone novel. Um, uh, the, apparently, uh, the actor who plays one of the main characters in this uh, in the game was also at the uh, table. I never got to meet him. He was he was busy when I was there, but he was also present. And then, of course, Michael Stackpole wrote the book, and so I am very interested to read this. I've never played Gears of War, and I've never read any of their novels, but I love tie-in fiction, and I love Michael Stackpole, and so I'm sure I will enjoy it. And after re reading Halo, a Halo book recently and loving it, I'm sure I can jump right in. And then the other book of his that I purchased was A Secret Atlas, which is the first book in a fantasy trilogy, kind of about um, an exploration fantasy, which has me really excited. This is this is a unique cover and a unique type of book, so I'm I'm excited to read this, the first in the trilogy, and so I got to interview. Mr. Stackpole. It was a lot of fun. Um, and so it goes on for about 15, 12-ish minutes. Uh, you'll see the edited down version a little bit. Um, and so without much further ado, here is that video. All right. So I'm joined today by Michael Stackpole. Sir, thank you for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. Um, so the first question I have is you've written for several media tie-in fiction properties, including you know, Star Wars, right. Battletech, Gears of War. What makes tie-in fiction an appealing property as a writer? Um, 
Well, as a writer, you know, career-wise, uh, you're always looking to expand your audience. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I do, because I get approached to do a lot of tie-in stuff, yeah. is does this property have a slice of audience I don't already have? Mm-hmm. Or is it the sort of property that the people I already have will enjoy? Yeah. And so I'm looking at, at, at those sorts of things. You know, I, I, I do my own original fantasy, so there's very few fantasy properties I've looked at doing, but I've done stuff for Howard, uh, for uh, Robert E. Howard Conan stuff, mm-hmm. because I always loved that. And yeah. so, and, and Robert E. Howard sells more fantasy books than I do. <laughs> um, and, and I did Pathfinder because the guys who own Pathfinder are friends of mine, and, yeah. and I enjoy their work. And so, you know, so you make a lot of those decisions. Um, so the really good thing about doing tie-in work is, again, you have a guaranteed audience, uh, and, and so that's that's really, really cool. The downside is that in the long run, if it really takes off, you don't make as much money as you would if something that your original work um, would would do when it takes off. So. Okay. And uh, the next uh, question I have is, I, like a lot of people, really love Italian Revenant. That's okay. my favorite book of yours. Um, the way it told standalone fantasy novel, yet had tons of world building, was excellent. Um, uh, we talked off camera about this, but do you have any updates on the sequel? I know you have a Patreon. Yeah, I have a Patreon project, and, and there I've been doing the sequel as a, as a serial. Um, I expect that the sequel should be finished. The principal writing on the sequel should be finished. Uh, probably this summer, uh, and after that, we'll look at doing a Kickstarter project. But I have to, um, because I was telling it as a serial story, uh, I, I've got to go back through. And there's probably things I need to streamline, yeah. and other things I need to add in and, and back up. And it's the, the cool thing about looking at it if you're back in the Patreon project and, and, and reading throughout is that you're really going to need to see the first draft of a novel. Yeah. Um, messy as they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And so sometimes there are things that were important in the beginning that get totally lost by the end. Yeah. And uh, there are other things that show up in the middle and you go, oh, I better attach that to the beginning <laughs> of the story. So so it's kind of a, a, a bit of an educational process, too, in, in, um, in how all it goes together. And there's a little bit of a... You, people, the readers like that type of thing because they understand the process. Sure, And it gets sure. kind of a peek behind the curtain. Well, it gives them a peek behind the curtain and I also suspect there's a lot of the it's readers... So that are not even noticing some of that in yeah. terms of things that get dropped you just don't notice because suddenly there's new things that you're attached onto and, and eventually at some point you're going to go whatever happened to and and that's the job of the second draft and editors to say by the way you need to throw this away or connect this up <laughs> and stuff so Good. and you said you might be doing a Kickstarter yeah I mean, Kickstarter is one of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll look at doing for it I mean I would love to the question is um, what is the market going to bear? Is it going to work? I mean, Brandon Sanderson just did his Kickstarter and was fabulously successful with it. You know, more power to him. I think yeah. that's great. Um, I think what I'd be doing would be a little bit more modest. <laughs> but, but looking at his project, you know, it helps you begin to answer some of the questions of, do I want to do a hardback version? Would mm-hmm. people be receptive to a hardback version? Yeah. You know, and, and then I might have to talk to Bantam and find out, can we do a hardback version? Can I get back the rights to doing hardback version of Italian Revenant? And and would people want that as an add-on or something on, the, on that, that order? Plus, you know, who do you get to do the cover? And, yeah. and you know, is, is, is just having a $500 cover, is that what we're going to go with with the project? And the stretch goal is, <laughs> you know, add $5,000 so I can get someone else to do a cover. Exactly. You know, so there's a lot of fun parameters to kind of play with there. And you have know, other people like um, Kevin Anderson. He just did a Kickstarter right, for his right. books, and that's doing well. He's hit his. So I think the market is kind of moving towards, like, I, I read in your books that you started out, you were really big into the, the mass market phase. Right, right, right. And then you've more recently gotten into the ebook phase with your In Hero Years. Sure, series. sure. How has that been trying to stay on the cutting edge of everything? You know, the, the, the business is constantly changing. Mm-hmm. I, I, one of the things, especially with the digital age, and by digital age, I just don't mean ebooks, but print on demand and all of those things. Uh, people will say it's the Wild West out there. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, Columbus has not even landed on the continent. <laughs> we have no idea where this stuff is 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 really going. Yeah. Um, so, trying to stay on that cutting edge, trying to solve problems. I mean, the the age old problems. I mean, literally since. Uh, well, literally, one of the models, Kickstarter model, mm-hmm. is the model that Edgar Allan Poe used really? when publishing his stuff. 
when Poe wanted to publish his first collection of, of, of poems, and this is not at all unusual, poems and stories, um, because this is the way it was done, he would approach a printer, and the printer would agree to print 500 copies if Poe could sell 250. So Poe would go out and get people to subscribe to his book, and they would take that money, and then they would print what was going on, and then they would have the rest to sell. Um, and so that's really what Kickstarter is. Yeah. And so you have to have your business plan in place. You know, you, you hopefully are going to print extra copies so you can come to a show and somebody who didn't get in on the Kickstarter can now get that, you know, can get that copy. But the guys who got into the Kickstarter, you know, the, the special $100, mm-hmm. you know, leather-bound edition or whatever, yeah. you know, they, they got it for $80, you know, and, and the guy at this show is going to be paying $120. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, now we're having to learn the business and learn all the different trappings and how it goes. I come out of the gaming industry having been a publisher, so I understand a chunk of that, but with the new technology and print on demand and, and, you know, uh, all the different things. Do you print in China? Do you print here? You know, it's, it's... it's constantly changing and you're constantly having to learn. So it's very exciting. I mean, I, I, I love learning all that stuff. So. Yeah. The, the next question is, uh, so your X-Wing books have influenced quite a many fans, including me, uh, and writers for the last 30 years. Uh, did you and your editors realize that the popularity that they would reach, or was that more of a surprise? It, w- it, was, really, it was really funny because um, uh, we didn't... Uh, we didn't really anticipate um, how big a fandom Wedge Antilles had. Yeah. Because Wedge's fandom built because of the videotapes. Mm-hmm. But when you're watching the movies in the theater, unless you watched it 50 times in the theater, you weren't really clocking that Wedge was there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But in the videotapes, you know, it, it was easy to see Wedge, uh, you know, all the time. He was a survivor. So we didn't expect it to be, to be that big. And it was very funny. Uh, San Diego Comic Con before uh, Rogue Squadron came out I had dinner with Kevin J. Anderson yeah. and uh, Kevin leaned across the table to me and all serious said you don't have to worry about your book being the first one not to hit the New York Times bestseller list <laughs> because uh, uh, you know the first of the anthologies uh, Tales from Jabba's Palace or yeah. I think that was it uh, didn't make it so yeah. that you know so don't worry you know you're not going to be the first <laughs> and I, I get a little a little Torqued at that remark, right? You know, it was like, how dare you? But you know, I, I mean, I had no expectations. And when and when Rogue Squadron hit, I mean, that was that was something else. And then each of the others, you know, hit. And oh, then it was then it was uh, the, the third Predator Strap, third one. Um, the week before it uh, debuted. Um, Stephen King had five books on the New York Times bestseller list yep. in the paperback category, and nobody at Bantam thought that <laughs> that Pride of Strap would make it, and it knocked one of King's books off. <laughs> now this was when he was doing the Green Mile, so it was just it knocked one of those installments off, and so it was just amazing. And then then when the first of Aaron's books yep. came out, it hit in the first week, and I got a note, very nice note from uh, uh, Chris Rush, um, and she said. You know, it's great Aaron's book made it, but you realize his book made it on the first week on the strength of what you did. Yeah. You know, and that was and 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 it was it was nice having that acknowledgement from someone else in the industry. So did we expect that? No. And then, you know, a year and a half ago, to see the announcement that, that Patty Jenkins is gonna be doing gonna be doing the, the, the Rogue Squadron movie and she has been just great about saying, look, you know, the, the X-Wing books, they are the foundation of what I'm doing, and, and, and she's been absolutely great about saying that publicly, so yeah. it's very, very cool. I would say one of my favorite moments in the fandom ever was when they made the announcement for Rogue Squadron, I was looking to see all, like, what you were saying about it, and right. I saw that she retweeted something that you wrote, and right, I'm like, right. it's not like someone where it's like, 
J.K. Rowling where your sales are through the roof, so of course they're going to respond to the author. Right, this right, is, right. Tie-in fiction is a smaller group, so the fact that she would seek you out and find your tweet and retweet it and, oh, yeah. and respond and say that you and Aaron oh, yeah. really were foundational. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, 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 yeah. I was yeah. like, okay, I trust her. I'm, I'm yep, trusting yep, this project. Yep. Well, and it was, it, what was really funny about it was that, is that you know, the, the, the announcement came out, and, and I had two friends who are journalists dealing with a lot of this. Yeah. And suddenly my phone starts blowing up with text from them going, hey, man, have you seen the news? <laughs> like, what news? What are you talking about? Something's it's a Thursday afternoon. You know, whatever happens on Thursday afternoons. And they're going, okay, go to your computer. <laughs> See Twitter. Here is the link. It was like, oh, my God, you know. And so then you have to say something. And then when she retweeted that, yeah. and, and it was like being in high school again, because it's like, you know, she retweeted it. It's like, wow, that's cool. And then she followed me. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, so, yeah, it was really funny. <laughs> now, uh, switching gears, you talked about, switching gears. You talk about uh, being in gaming, and yep. you have a new novel that you can see on the screen, Gears, Gears of War. Of War. Right, right. Um, uh, they haven't had too many books re- uh, right. up until recently, the last couple of years. Right, they've been right. building up. So, can you kind of pitch that book and also say why uh, Gears of War was a series you were interested in writing? Sure. Um, Gears of War. I'm mean, a really well known, well known series. Uh, military science fiction, which is pretty much in my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the more one of the more popular and iconic games out there. Um, they were they, they approached me uh, uh, as to whether or not I was interested. Yeah. Um, this was during the pandemic, uh, and and so I was you know going to start doing my research to figure out is this something, and, and I went over to to my 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 Corona pod, uh, <laughs> and I walk into the walk into the friend's house, the people I was uh, quarantining with, and they're playing. Uh, Gears of War. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, I guess this is a sign. Uh, and uh, and so that was a lot of fun. And then when I finally got to talk to the um, uh, the folks, um, what they wanted and, and what this book is, is it's set uh, right after Gears 3, yeah. right after Dom Santiago dies and, and, and the, the, the problem is, is put to rest, uh, seemingly, and... and and we know the, the 25 years between years three and years four, mm-hmm. we know a lot of the world is rebuilt. And so they wanted a book where they, they entrusted to me, uh, Marcus and Anya, uh, to set them on the path that they would realize, which means Anya's got to begin to take responsibility that will eventually put her into power. Mm-hmm. And with Marcus... Uh, Marcus has got to be dealing with the loss of his friend and with the fact that that there's now peace and he has spent you know his whole entire life fighting yeah. um, and so those were you know the fact that they would give me the responsibility for those characters and then as we talked it was like okay look you know this is this is how I can approach the novel or this is how I can approach the novel and they're going you know, let's let's try this let's try this more difficult way yeah. let's let's do that and and it was like I can do what you want but I'm going to bring another character in okay that's cool it's, so you know it was really a, a very um, a symbiotic relationship uh, making it work and you don't always get that with uh, with franchisees uh, and and so it was really it was it, I really enjoyed working with them to to make this work since they I know they did like a few books from Karen Travis in like early right, 2010s right. and then about 2018 2019 they ramped up a few more and I yep. hope they keep ramping it up because I've noticed that it's really hard to find tie-in fiction books yeah, in yeah. bookstores anymore yeah so, yeah yeah uh, if anyone wants to find you online uh, where should they go I, to support you buy your books all that well stuff. so I have a Patreon project patreon.com Michael A. Stackpole um, and uh, the easiest way is to find me on Twitter just at Mike Stackpole that's where I'm most active. Yeah. You can ask questions and stuff like that. I, I uh, I'm 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 horrible at email uh, and and all these other things. So Twitter is probably the easiest place uh, to deal with me. All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, for you're more than welcome. No, uh, my pleasure. The second uh, interview I have today is the one that I did with the wonderful Dan Wells. Of course, Dan Wells is the writer of uh, some horror books, uh, some of which I've read uh, for this channel, including I Am Not a Serial Killer, 
and Mr. Monster, which was one of my favorite books that I read last year. I absolutely loved reading that book. I was hooked on it, and I was looking for an excuse to buy the third book in the series, and I got that excuse when I got to meet Mr. Wells. Thank goodness he had copies of it left. I don't know what I would have done if I did, if he didn't have more copies, because I needed to read that. And so I bought two books from him and got an interview. The books I got were, obviously book three in the trilogy, I Don't Want to Kill You, which I love this title. I love the cover. It just sticks out in your mind. You're like, oh, that's a, there's a great title. And then his other book, Ghost Station, uh, which is a new release in print. It was originally an auto audio original for Audible, and it has since uh, the rights have reverted to the print copy. And so now we have a print version. I am excited to read that as well. Before I start this interview, I need to preface it by saying the audio quality is not as good as the other interviews um, uh, because of some some factors. Uh, missed, after, after recording, Mr. Wells was very gracious and said he would be willing to re-record the uh, interview if uh, I wanted to and if I felt it was necessary. I didn't feel it was necessary because I didn't want to take away kind of the magic, the fun that the interview had. The, the, it was, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of fun questions that I asked him that were kind of got to see his reaction. Uh, and it didn't, it, I don't think it would work if I re-asked him the questions. And so note that the reason the audio was bad is because I didn't want to do the, re, the re-record the interview. Um, it is not, not the fault of Mr. Uh, Wells, who was very generous with his time at all. And so here is that uh, interview right here. All right, so today I am joined by Mr. Dan Wells. Thank you for joining me. I'm very happy to be here. So the first question I have is you have a new print edition of, an, I believe, an audio original that you wrote, right? Yes. Uh, and that is called Ghost Station. Ghost Station. Can you uh, tell me the pitch for this book? Yeah, so Ghost Station is about cryptographers in Berlin in 1961, two months after the wall goes up. Uh, This is an idea that I had while I was actually in Germany for the Frankfurt Book Fair, and I fell down one of those Wikipedia rabbit holes where like two hours later you're on an article you never intended to get on. And I was reading about various forms of cryptography, including what's called a one-time pad, which is considered to be an unbreakable code, if it is done correctly. And that all by itself inspired this entire plot about, well, what happens if it goes wrong in this particular way? And now I've got a pure historical, there's no supernatural elements or anything like that, it's just historical fiction about uh, double agents and paranoia in the early Cold War. It must have been really hard not to include supernatural elements. <laughs> that's, that's your bread and butter right there. It, it wasn't hard uh, <laughs> because in this particular case, I was very excited about it. Historical fiction is actually what I read more often than not. Um, and I, it's something I've tried to write before. I wrote a Western several years ago that was like the worst thing I've ever written. Uh, and so the chance to get in and... Uh, just do a pure historical fiction uh, was actually really refreshing and kind of exciting. Excellent. Um, so my next question is about your book. Your your seat. You, so you wrote the books. Uh, I am not a serial killer, and then you also wrote Mr. Monster. Yes. And Mr. Monster is my favorite. And I thought it was really impressive how you make the audience root for our odd protagonist, John Wayne Cleaver, to end up with the character of Brooke in that book, hey. even though he is kind of weird in some of his intricacies. Uh, how did you, how are you able to, to pull off uh, those obstacles and yet still make it work? Well, uh, basically I am hacking human nature with the character of John Cleaver. Uh, that is my single favorite part about the series, is I love making people root for someone even while he is doing bad things. And the trick is, uh, there's three tricks, really. Number one, he's funny. Yep. And so people tend to identify with him and like him Mm -hmm. because he's funny. Number two, um, he is always downtrodden. Mm -hmm. He is always getting the worst end of whatever stick he holds. And so we feel sorry for him. And we want him to feel better. We want him to be happy. Uh, we're very inherently communal people. We, we want to help each other. Last of all, 
John is always trying to do the right thing. He doesn't necessarily understand the right thing. He is sociopathic. He, he doesn't feel a connection to other people, but he knows intellectually that he should. And so he is working against his own nature in order to be what he thinks is a good person. And I think that everyone can identify with that. We all have the things that we wish we could do. We all are kind of constantly battle, battling our own human nature. And so we feel for him and we identify with him. And that helps put all the pieces together that even when he's doing something that we know is wrong, we're pulling for him. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, I, I absolutely was racing to the end of, of book two because of everything with his character that you realize he doesn't necessarily always know what's right, but he's always trying to do it. And yeah. he tries to save everyone in that house. Oh, oh. <laughs> now, I have a more superficial question that oh, I think you'll enjoy. Awesome. Have you ever integrated a food heist into your books? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> um, my cyberpunk series which is this one, Blue Screen, and it's two sequels. There are heists in that series, but uh, no. What I have done is I'm working on a another cyberpunk anthology in a totally different world. It's like a shared world anthology that I'm trying to put together. And I did write a food heist into that one. Um, it is all about... Uh, Kind of the, the core premise of the world is it's privatization run mad, and so it is uh, two rival snack companies that are fighting a very <laughs> bloody war over certain snack formulas and uh, technologies and things like that. So, oh, that's that's fantastic. I had a if you if not, when are you going to? So I know that in your you guys are always talking about food heists. That's yes, become the thing that people. Uh, uh, make synonymous with you now. Yeah, on Intentionally Blank, any anyone out there who doesn't know what we're talking about, I do a, a YouTube show and a podcast with Brandon Sanderson called Intentionally Blank. And food heists, people who steal ridiculous dollar values of food, that's like my single favorite news category. And so whenever we have a good one, we will talk about it on the show. And it has absolutely taken on a life of its own, where if we have an episode without a food heist in it, everyone asks, like, where's the food heist this year? That's that's what they've come to love about it, so. Now, uh, it's funny that you went into Intentionally Blank, because that was my next question. Um, with Intentionally Blank, you guys have kept up every week, and you continue mm -hmm. to deliver great content with that. Oh, thank which you. Which is kind of a different part of being an author, is not just the writing, but also the connecting with people yes. uh, that comes with that. Did you, one, expect the podcast to have its staying power? Two, do you foresee it continuing on in the long term? Well, I mean, the answer to the first question is Brandon Sanderson is on it. <laughs> it could be us, like, picking our noses on camera for an hour and people would watch it because it's Brandon Sanderson. Um, but he and I have known each other for decades. Uh, we're very good friends. We share so many uh, kind of artistic and humor sensibilities. And so it's basically a show about us just trying to make each other laugh for an hour. <laughs> and that is something that we do all the time anyway. And so there's incredible longevity in the concept. I am hoping that we can continue to do this for quite a long time. Excellent. Now, um, this one's a little bit more of a somber one. So one of your college professors, Dave Farland, is one of my favorite mm -hmm. authors ever. Um, his Moonwood series, I thought that was fantastic. And I know he was not only a major influence on the genre, but also on your class, which had several big writers in it. Yep. Um, for you personally, is there one thing that Mr. Farland taught you that you still incorporate into your books? I mean, first of all, yes. Uh, Dave Wolverton, pen name Dave Farland, he's absolutely a mentor and a hero for me. Um, the, the most important thing he taught me was simply that you can make a living as an artist. Before him, no one had ever told me that. Uh, we have an educational system in the United States that really tells people the opposite of that. Uh, we are year by year cutting artistic programs out of our schools. We want to get kids 
into cubicles, earning pensions, and really trying to stamp out any kind of artistic education. And so Wolverton stepping in, uh, Dave is a, is a hero of mine for that reason. And a lot of what I've done with my career is trying to pay that forward, trying to create, you know, I, I have another podcast called Writing Excuses <laughs> that uh, is entirely about helping give a hand up to aspiring writers just like Dave helped me. Um, in terms of, of writing craft in the class itself, um, he always had a very strong focus on character, of making sure that people can find not just a cool story, but a cool person that they love spending time with. And I continue to try to do that with all of my books. You, when you read a book like this, you're inviting this person into your brain for who knows how many hours or days. You want to you want to spend that time with someone that you want to spend time with, and that's a that's a really good lesson that I learned from Dave. Excellent. The final question I have for you is now we know Ghost Station is out now. It just came out in print edition. Yes. Uh, do you have any other projects that are upcoming? And also, where can people find you? Uh, online or, or anywhere to contact you to buy books, okay. books, all that stuff. So, um, I have basically fled social media entirely. <laughs> uh, I am still on Twitter, even though that's one of the worst ones. It's a never-ending trash fire of anger and screaming. But, if you look for The Dan Wells, The Dan Wells, um, that is my website, that is my Twitter handle, um, that is the place to find me. Um, if you want to actually ask me questions, look for Intentionally Blank on YouTube, because I usually read through the comment sections of those and try to respond to people. Um, the, uh, the, the next project that I have coming up, Brandon Sanderson and I are collaborating on a project called Dark One. And he put out a graphic novel a year or two ago that you may have read. Uh, I am doing a novel that is based on the same outline. They, it is going to be very different from the graphic novel. Uh, not because the, I mean, the graphic novel is wonderful, but I decided to take this in a, in a slightly different direction. So it's the same outline interpreted through a completely different creative lens. Um, and then what we have... That, I don't know when that book is coming out, but uh, we created a prequel to it called Dark One Forgotten that is going to come out this fall. I think in October is the plan. And that will not be prose. That's actually going to be released as six audio episodes in the form of a mock uh, true crime podcast. Wow. Uh, so I have I've written six episodes of a fake podcast in which a uh, young woman is looking into a true crime story that turns into a supernatural story and uh, ends up leading into the Dark One series. So that's that's what I've got coming out next. I'm so excited for that because you you and Brandon are two of my favorite authors. So oh well, thank Steve you Kowal very much. Will be so exciting. Man. Thank you for, for doing this interview. Oh, no, I'm happy to have done it. The third interview I have today is from the CEO of Bard's Tower. Um, uh, this interview, I was able to sit down with the CEO. He and I had a conversation about what Bard's Tower is, uh, how long it's been around, what formed Bard's Tower, why they do what they do, and how they're able to run the logistics of it. And as someone who is interested not just in reading books, but also in the book industry, this was a fascinating discussion. And so uh, here's the vid video and audio for that. All right, so I am joined today with Alexi Vandenberg of Bard's Tower. Can you tell everyone uh, uh, first uh, what you do here uh, at the Bard's Tower and what your whole, the whole company is? Absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Alexi Vandenberg. Uh, Bard's Tower is the literary celebrity experience that operates nationally that goes from pop culture event to pop culture event. 
Um, what we are doing is bringing authors and readers together in ways that have not been tried before. Okay, and um, are you guys part of a larger network, or is it... Um, a larger network, we are a part, we are a nationally operating bookstore. Uh, we are actually, we are actually um, part of a large network of authors that, you know, we have a rotating cast that comes in through uh, various you know various channels ranging from New York Times bestsellers, uh, writing superstars, as well as you know midlisters and first timers and, and guys just beginning their career. But what it is is that ultimately what you would like to do is have um, an opportunity for an author to build their brand and their reputation and do so in a manner that is uh, both collaborative but also one that is informative both to the readers, mm -hmm. the audience, as well as themselves. Um, a lot of authors here learn from each other. They learn, you know, various tricks in terms of not only craft and writing, but also, you know, approaches of how to sell, how to approach their, uh, their uh, you know, their audiences and so on. And uh, people can mix and match and choose, and being able to collaborate together on something like this is certainly a uh, an opportunity that is that is well received and well, well highly recommended. Yes. And how long has Bard's Tower been operating? Now? Bard's Tower has been operating for 12 years. 12 years. Wow. Yes. Um, starting with um, a uh, group called Wordfire Press, which was run by Kevin J. Anderson. Mm -hmm. um, Bard's Tower's first iteration was actually the Wordfire Press booth. Okay. And uh, Kevin had actually come to me and had asked me about marketing advice because yeah. uh, the parent company for Bard's Tower is Rabbit Fanboy Marketing. And, you know, he's like, have you ever thought about doing, like, book promotion before? Yeah. And I'm like, well, no. <laughs> I, I've never been in book promotion or book publishing, yeah. let alone book marketing, so... I'm not sure I would be particularly well suited for the job. He's like, well, if you look at publishers, they don't know much about marketing either. <laughs> so you're well, so you're you're probably ahead of the game. I was like, uh oh. <laughs> so we had a conversation about it, and after uh, looking at a marketing plan that was given to him by a publisher, I was like, so you're doing uh, a book signing? He's like, yes, that that's the plan. I was like, okay, why? And he's like, well, what do you mean, why? I was like, these bookstores, how many how many people do you get? He's like, well, you know, about 50, maybe 100. I was like, okay, 100. How many people walked into those bookstores? And he's like, about 500. I was like, so one out of five was there to see you. Yeah. Okay. Well, if that's the case, what if we go to pop culture events where literally 20 to 30,000 people are walking through the door who are fans of science fiction fantasy already. Yeah. And then what you can do is, is that you can build, you can connect to your old audience, build a new audience, and actually do it synergistically. Nice. And, and I, I like that. And you see that not just with Bart's Tower, but also a lot of authors are trying to make it to conventions, but it is expensive getting everyone here, Absolutely. getting the apparatus. I mean, uh, I'll have some shots here going, showing what Bart's Tower is. It's an impressive feat of everything you're oh, able thank to get you. here. Um, uh, does this require like, a, a big staff, or are you guys able to do it pretty minimal? Um, we have a somewhat mo moderate staff. Yeah. Um, actually, we just expanded our staff. Nice. Um, uh, Michelle Corey, who is here today with us, is actually now the director of development for uh, Prince of Cats Literary Productions. But we also hired Morgan K. Uh, Morgan K. David, who is uh, my assistant, and she is also on staff support. So. She is uh, going to be helping me out. At one point, we were a one-man band. Uh, you know, I had everything from the tuba suit to the, oh, you know. I imagine that's a lot. Of There's a lot of organ grinding going on. But. Um, when it comes to getting the authors, do you, are you approached by authors, or do you, or do you, do you approach the authors? It is a combination of both, actually. Okay. Um, what happens is, is that there are a great many authors who were either part of the Wordfire Press original setup. Uh, that has its 
expanded and there are authors who see the value in what we do and also they don't want to schlep around you know a, a you know, four luggages full of books to come to a yeah. show um, but they also don't have to deal with we do the negotiation with shows we talk to them about logistics we talk to them about panels and so on we're literally a for lack for lack of a better term we're a literary track in a can Okay. For whichever show wants us to have a literary track. And readership is actually going up exponentially as time goes on. And I suspect, though I haven't seen numbers on this, that the pandemic has actually inc uh, increased and probably exacerbated that trend. So you're going to actually see more readers rather than less readers as time goes on. Uh, so there are more people who are interested in the writing as a craft, writing as a career, and also writing as entertainment. Now, you're, um, uh, you said you've got sometimes really small authors, sometimes you get really big authors. Who are some of the biggest authors that you guys have had the privilege of getting to work with? Oh, I mean, my list of big authors, I mean, ranging from Jim Butcher, oh, Brandon, yeah. uh, Brandon Sanderson, Kevin J. Anderson, Sherilyn Kenyon, Jody Lynn Nye, um, Michael Stackpole, who is here, Dan Wells, authors who are New York Times bestsellers, yep. and uh, just amazing people all around. Excellent. Um, uh, now, you said you've also had some debuts. Have you uh, noticed that you guys have been able to really... Boost. Is there anyone who's like readership took off because you guys were able to help them? Out uh, I actually, I would say that there are a great many authors who have seen their sales and their name recognition increase with their presence with Bars Tower, because what happens is that there's a certain um, being at the celebrity bookstore is a little different than just being at you know your own corner booth. Yeah. You actually are able to sit there and say, "Well, gee, I'm, you know, I'm here selling my books next to Kevin J. Anderson or Jim Butcher or so on." There is that that push of going, "Oh, if Jim is here and I like Jim's work, I yeah. might like this person's work too," mm -hmm. and so on. Um, you know, if I'm a, a huge science fiction uh, fan and I'm next to Kevin J. Anderson, who yeah. is this screen developer along with Brian Herbert for, yeah. for the Dune movie, let alone the Dune books, and I go, oh, that's cool, and I have, you know, this writer over here who's also writing, you know, science fantasy or science fiction. Um, oh, well, he's with Kevin. Yeah. I might take a chance on it. Exactly. And you're able to get that. And this isn't now a retail marketplace that most authors do not have access to. And also, with the logistics and so on, we make it feasible for them to come on out. Well, if anyone wants to contact you, where do they go? Uh, well, they can contact me on my website, which is RFB Holdings or The Bard's Tower. You can also reach me on Facebook at Bards Tower, or just my own, which is, you know, type that in, and you can uh, you can reach us that way. But you can also catch me on uh, Twitter, Facebook, all the regular, you know, regular channels of social media. I'm kind of hard to miss. <laughs> well, thank you so much for doing this interview thank you. today. And uh, make sure to go to those websites. And uh, what's your next convention? Uh, our next convention is going to be Philly Fan Expo. Nice. In which we're going to be with Dan Wells, Claudia Gray from uh, Star Wars, from Star Wars yeah. as well as Wendy and Richard Peeney from ElfQuest. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be a good time. All right. Thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. Well, that finishes all of the uh, interviews I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you again to Bart's Tower. I cannot emphasize how nice the people at Bart's Tower, how nice Michael Stackpole, and how nice Mr. Dan Wells were with their time. They absolutely did not have to do the interview, uh, the interviews that they gave, and yet they were very gracious. And so I thank you so much. Thank you for signing the books that I brought and for signing the books that I bought there. It was a lot of fun. Uh, please check out Bart's Tower, see what other uh, uh, conventions they'll be going to. They go to a lot of conventions every year. And check out uh, these authors, their, their various places. Michael Stackpole, check out his Patreon. And for Dan Wells, check out uh, his uh, 
YouTube channel, or check out Brandon Sanderson's YouTube channel to see their podcast together, Intentionally Blank, which is a fantastic podcast. I love I love listening and watching that. So uh, please check out all these authors' things and show them lots of love. Uh, but until next time, I'm Jonathan, and thank you for watching. Thank you.